You're the heart of my contentment. You're the hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Are you ready? Hold someone's hand and say, Our Father, we stand together in faith and we receive this afternoon a free flow of revelation knowledge in our hearts. We receive the knowledge of Christ in accuracy and precision. There is no contradiction in this atmosphere. We have precision and exactness of knowledge. Our hearts receive the knowledge of the Son and we behold Him as He sees us in Him. He is glorified and we are edified. Amen. Amen. Go away to God. Come on now, quickly. Go to Philemon 6. Philemon 6. Glory to God. You know, the fellowship we have with the Father now becomes the fellowship we have with one another. Before you go in there, go to 1 John 1. 1 John 1. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. 1 John 1. Thank you, Jesus. Whatever I am now, it is by your grace. Many are dying. Many are perishing. That's a praise song. Many are dying. Many are perishing. First John 1 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So the preaching of the gospel is fellowship. You are making what you have available to others. Remember, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature, all things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Then it says, all things are God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now that's what he has done for us. He now gave us the ministry of what he has done. The ministry of reconciliation. To wit, verse 19, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, and not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he had committed unto us the message of reconciliation. So the pre- you know, in the morning we said, the preaching of the gospel is our confession. Come on. Are you still there? So the preaching of the gospel is our fellowship. Because we are giving to men what we have received from God. It's our fellowship. It's a fellowship of the Father. So the preaching of the gospel as it were, is an introduction or an invitation for men to be welcomed into that fellowship, to receive that fellowship. So the message is not about us, it's not about our experience, it's about the gift that is available to everybody. Our fellowship. And so, in Philemon 6, don't forget again, what we give is what we have received. See, what I give is what I have received. Very good. Remember, Paul says, we are able ministers of the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now, that means we minister the Spirit. Then it says the Spirit gives life. We minister what we have been given. So our fellowship that is what we make available, is what has been made available to us. We are competent. I said we are competent. competent. Philemon 6. Are you still there? Praise the Lord. Sometimes you can say, are you still there four times? If you have listened to Kenneth Higgin a lot, you will say it even to yourself, am I still there? <laughs> It's Brother Hagin that does it. Are you still there? So you say it a lot of times. Praise the Lord. Philemon 6. Paul is praying a prayer here and he says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual 
by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ. Now he's praying, don't forget, because in verse 4, uh, he says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. So verse 3, verse 5 was not the prayer. Hearing of thy love and faith, we thou art towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints. He's talking to Philemon here. So he's praying. Now if you observe Paul's prayers, Paul's prayers always had a point, an action plan to it, a PowerPoint. In the prayer to the uh, Ephesian church, he says that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know, verse 17, what is the hope of his calling. So that prayer is knowledge-based. And that knowledge, he now says, will cause you to walk. Because later on, in chapter 4, verse 1, say, now therefore walk worthy of the Lord. So your walk is based on what you have known. Your walk, your actions, is now based on what you have known. Hallelujah. Based on what you have known. So when he says that you may know, that becomes practical. That is working knowledge. Something that you recognize, that you appreciate. You appreciate it. You appreciate it a lot. That is, you, you say it so often. You recall it in your mind. So I'm praying for you so that what I have taught you does not just stay in the realm of knowledge, but in the realm of what you value. That's why he prayed. Now, in Philippi, what we call the Philippian prayer, Philippian church prayer, Philippians 1, the focus of that prayer, even though it was knowledge, had a different slant. Philippians 1, he says in verse 9, that your love may abound yet more and more in judgment and in all discernment or judgment, knowledge and discernment, that you may approve. That is, your sense of judgment has changed. Things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. So the prayers have results. In the first instance, you see it in your walk. You value the truth of the word. You value the cause of Christ. You value the finished work of redemption. In this instance, it is your judgment. How you walk with people, your discernment changes. So when this prayer is working in a man's life, you see the fruits of righteousness. He's now sincere. He's without offense. So, this is the kind of prayer I'll pray for a brother who struggles with strife. That he will be without offense. That his love will abound. Now, when something abounds, it means we see it. It overflows. He becomes available to us. So, you pray that prayer. Now, in Colossae, he prayed differently. I, I, I believe I did a series on this a uh, couple of times uh, a while back uh, Forgotten the series again. Uh, forgotten the series. I'll, 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 I'll try and remember. Colossians 1 9. For this cause also, since the day we heard it. Now, these are folks that he never met. He didn't see them at this point. To pray for you and to desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to the glorious power unto all patience, long-suffering, and joyfulness. See the result now? Patience, long-suffering, joyfulness. Because Colossians had all sort of knowledge bombarding it. said, now you will increase in spiritual wisdom and understanding. So the focus was different. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, this time around, he says you should pray for us. He says, pray for us. Now, this is how to pray for your pastor. You don't pray Ephesians 1 for your pastor. To pray, he says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have a free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Then verse 2 says that we might be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men 
For all men have not faith. That's a prayer for a pastor. In Romans chapter 15, it says to pray for us now again. It says in verse 30, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Verse 31, That I may be delivered from them that are, that do not believe in Judea, and that my servants which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. Then it says in verse 32, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may be, may with you be refreshed. Look at the different, can you see that the prayers were different? Huh? Can you see it? They're different. So we have what is called spirit-inspired prayers. They are not prayers of emotional disposition. They are Spirit-inspired prayers. In Hebrews 13, just the last one, this is the writer of Hebrews now, Hebrews 13. There are several prayers, I just picked these ones. Uh, Hebrews 13. To check our book, Because I Pray, we put the emphasis of these things there. Hebrews 13, 20. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, he says, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect, in every good work, to do his will, walking in you that which is pleasing inside, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. To walk in the will of God. He prays. So go to Philemon. In Philemon, he says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. Now, let me give you a background of that letter. He wrote to Philemon about someone, Onesimus, who must have broken out or f fallen out, pardon me, with Philemon. Obviously, he offended Philemon. He was his ex-staff, and then he went away. And Paul met Onesimus and found out Onesimus was Philemon's staff. Onesimus had become a Christian. And so, Paul is now praying for Philemon. As a background, because he's about to give him an instruction. Just like every letter he wrote, he will give an instruction after he had said the prayer. He says, look, that the communication of thy faith. Now, he had said to him that I've heard of your love for all the saints in verse 5. So, the fact that you're already walking in the light of the word doesn't mean you don't need that prayer again. So he says, in verse, Philemon now, verse 6, that the communication of thy faith. Now, the word communication is the same word we have been looking at since. The word koinonia, which we say the contribution. He says that the contribution of your faith, or the availability of your faith, what James called faith without works. That is, faith that is not of benefit to the third party, to others. He says that the communication of your faith, the contribution, may become effectual. The word effectual is the word energies. E-N-E-R-G-S. It's, it's an adjective. It describes the faith. The communication of it. It becomes effective. Uh, a, a dictionary calls it continuous activity. That is, he does not stop when it comes to uh, Onesimus. It says that the communication of the faith may become effectual. It doesn't stop. How? By the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you. In Christ. The word acknowledging there is from the Greek word epignosis. The same word we read earlier in Ephesians 1, 16 and 17. Epignosis. It means exact knowledge or a recognition or an appreciation, a precise understanding. Now, notice something. The moment you stop to recognize the things that are in you in Christ, the contribution of your faith 
will cease. Because you are, you, you are only giving what you have. The moment you don't recognize what you have, you cannot give it. So there is a consistent appreciation and recognition of what belongs to us that makes the supply available. Now listen carefully now. So, the moment I discover in my Christian work that I have no supply, it's not because God hasn't supplied. It's because I have failed to recognize it. The moment there is no supply, there is no cutoff of supply from the Father. No. The Father's fellowship is ceaseless. It's eternal. But our fellowship with one another, where we make available, we contribute of our faith, will be contingent or basically dependent on our appreciating those things. Now look, follow this one. The things that are in you in Christ. Can we say the things that are in the spirit? Right? Very good. Because Romans chapter 8, verse 9, verse 8 says, you are not, So those that are in the flesh cannot please God, but since you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. If any has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He says, because Christ is in you, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If Christ be in you. So Christ is in you. That's the spirit. We read earlier, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, the Lord is that spirit. John 14, 16 and 17, how pray the Father, he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he sees him not. Neither knows him. But he dwells with you and shall be in you. And in 20, in that day you will know I am in my Father and I, you are in me and I am in you. So the indwelling of the spirit is Christ in you. What does that mean? That means that there is a supply. And so my fellowship with believers is also supernatural. What I make available to believers is also supernatural. This is what makes Christian gatherings. You know, anybody can gather. In your company, you have board meetings and other organizations that you belong to. In your university, you can have class lectures. You go for your postgraduate degree, you have class. It's also a meeting. And what is common in there will probably, you are all studying business administration. Your master's in MBA now, or you're studying a postdoctoral degree, and everybody that's what is common in there. So, what you'll be sharing in there will be that. I don't expect, for example, that um, when, we, for, when we go to the faculty of law in my first year, uh, you know, we had to take some courses from other departments. And we got to one particular department, uh, the philosophy department, where they were doing logic. Did you do logic? And then they began to do, they, it now got to a point, and it is assumed that most law students are mathematics illiterate. So, when we got to logic, and they started counting figures, some guy's eyes just turned blue, ha. Huh? <laughs> and the guy says, no, no, it's not mathematics. You know. But by the time we got back to the faculty, and what was common to all of, and there were some guys, they would pass those elective courses very well. And then the, the real ones, the ones that are common, they will back them over. <laughs> Not carry, they will back them over. <laughs> they are believers like that. What is common, they don't know it. The electives. So, let us talk about business. They just get. You think they are anointed for it? You see, if you do this, if you invest in this one, and this one, and this one, and, and they're very good at it. 
They can come and tell us, you know, how, you know, you say when you want to plan ministry, you have your project point. You have your mission statement. Your mission statement must be three words that are catchy. As a man is going, he sees it, he remembers it. Don't make it too long. Ministry. He said, make your signboard so that it can be roving. So he that wrote it can read it. <laughs> Years ago, we released a book, Tell the World. So we're deliberating on what the cover page should be. And the brother said, let's put women. We said, why? He said, that's what sells. Tell the world. I think the world is the one telling us by that. <laughs> but if folks, that's what they know. Nothing wrong. You can know those electives. How do we place the sound? Some guys are so good. If you want quality sound, you call them. Quality sound. The brethren. You fix this one. Fix that one. They know how to take care of security of the man of God. Say, one, two, one, two, move, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> you see them. They know how the man of God should dress. Someone told me one time, went for me and said, yes, this car is man of God's car. Those are the people that turn preachers to corrupt people. What's man of God's car? Chariots. <laughs> so, you know, but there is what is common. That is what the Father gave us. The one that is available in Christ Jesus. In the Spirit. You can call them the compulsory courses. The ones that are available in the spirit. And then he says that the communication of your faith, the sharing of your faith, becomes effective by that acknowledgement. Now, the sharing doesn't come to you. The sharing goes to others. And most of the time, when we, in, in Christian gatherings, when we discover that something has gone wrong, rather than ask ourselves how much of this recognition we are still making, we blame others. He didn't say the communication of your faith becomes effective if people are praying for you. He didn't say that. It becomes effective when the brethren like you. No. He says, by you acknowledging every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ. That's what he said. And so, go to Acts 2. It's interesting, some people are against Christian gatherings. There's nothing called church. And you see them watching church service online. <laughs> some guys are just a bunch of comedians. Real comedians. It's like those who believe that uh, nobody needs to hear the gospel. Nobody needs to believe. But they have already believed. They are believers. Who say nobody has to believe? Why did you not not believe? So you can preach it very well. <laughs> Acts 2.42. Are you there? Acts 2.42. He says, Acts 2, 42. He says, and they continued, after they received the gospel in verse 41, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, watch this, and contribution, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. The word is to share. Why was this so? That means there was fellowship, sharing, contribution. Look at verse 44. For all that believed were what? Together. And add all things common. Now, by the time the apostles taught them, they saw themselves as having a commonness. The teaching of the word put their attention. It took away their social status. Or it didn't make it relevant. Their age the educational background, and they now saw all things what? Common. That's not their degrees, not their cars, that's not where they live, no. So the teaching of God's word must always have this effect on us, where we see that commonness, what the Father has made available to us. Now, I want us to explore that word, all things common. 
it, it actually is used for ordinary things, non-special things. Non-special. They are all things common. Let's, let's see that word. The word there is koinois. I'll spell it for you. K-O-I-N-O-N-S. What does it mean? Look at Mark's Gospel chapter 7. Mark's Gospel chapter 7. And then verse 2. And they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled hands. That is to say, on washed hands. They found fault. Now that means nothing was done to the hand. It was just the normal hand. Because the Jews believe that when you want to eat, you wash your hand. So you, it's a special event. So he's saying, look, these guys didn't make anything special of it. And that's the word koinos, the same word, common. You see the same word in verse 5. Verse 5, it says, Then the Pharisees and, and, and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? Unwashing hands means common, ordinary hands. Now, remember in Acts 10, when uh, Peter went to the house of Cornelius, it was the same statement that the angel said to him, when he says, sorry, what the angel said, kill and eat. And Peter now said, not so. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Ordinary. Unwashed. He said the same thing in verse 28 when he said, that is, an un, that is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto, the, unto, unto one of another nation. For God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Uh, that's it. That's it. Common. It has nothing special to it. And he reported the same thing in Acts eleven eight. Now go to Romans four. Romans fourteen. So it's used for ordinary things, things that are not treated specially. Romans fourteen, and verse four. Who are thou? No, verse fourteen. I'm sorry for that. I know, but this is Paul, and I'm persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing common, that's the word unclean, of itself to him that esteems anything to be unclean, that's the word common, to him it is unclean, unwashed. What is public has no special treatment to it, so they call it impure. Yet, this is the same words that Luke used. He said, the believer had all things common. Like a, chi a seat anyone can sit on. Water anyone can drink from. That is nothing special. Believers had all things common. There was no segregation. There was no distinction. In Acts 4.32, Luke mentioned the same thing, Acts 4.32. Use the same word. Acts 4.32, he says, and the, belief, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that all the things in which he possessed was own, for they had all things common. Now, it didn't mean that people's properties became your own, no. What he's saying is this. Believers saw themselves as approachable. There was no distinction. And that's what the word fellowship implies. That we were available for one another. No believer required ceremony to live with the other person, in spite of their different, numerous, as it were, backgrounds. In Titus 1.4, Paul used it for the Christian life. Public. Titus 1 4. Like saying, I am for everybody, not that I belong to nobody. <laughs> okay. Like say, I'm for everybody. Because that which belongs to nobody and is for everybody is a public toilet. Titus 1 4. 
to Titus, my own son, after the common faith. That is what we all have. The common faith. You three. Hallelujah. Still out there? Jude. Three. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. So it's a common salvation. So the faith is called common. No, nobody has a special kind. It's a public thing. Salvation is common. Salvation is common. It's common to us. And so, it's from this commonness that the fellowship of the saints emerges from. Hear this well. What it means is that what is with you belongs to me. We'll drive out in a moment. And what is with me belongs to you. So, based on the understanding of the believer's community, they were able to give material things. They didn't start with giving. They, start, they started with teaching. It was teaching that made them see why they gave that way. They had to give that way. So, it's always wrong to have people just give without this understanding. They first of all had the understanding that we have all things in common. So, the guy who was a professor... And the guy who was not lettered, they saw something common about them, which was the faith. The guy who was 70 years old or 90 years old and the guy who was 15 years old, they saw what was common. It wasn't what they wore. It wasn't where they lived. It was who they really were. Hallelujah. You learning something here? So, it means it's available to everybody. So, the first and most important thing about Christian fellowship is to know that we have things in common. We must first of all realize that. It's very vital. And that's why it's very odd, you know, when we start to make distinctions. In, to people in local churches based on their social status, where they live, what they have, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So he comes in here and he says it's common to us. And because it's common to us, it means that you, hear this well, you actually are mine. And I am yours. I'm saying your spiritual status. Before you go and talk to somebody else. <laughs> Maybe I've been asking a sister for months now. The pastor has concluded it. <laughs> you are mine. And I am yours. I'm eternally yours. That's not what he's talking about. So... They let the believers see. And this is the reason why they gave the way they gave. So, by the time someone doesn't have, because I know this identity, his needs now become mine. I saw it. So, I could sell to supply that need. Because they were taught that believers' community, that believers' oneness, which is the mother of the fellowship we have with one another. Are you still there? I said, are you still there? So, what it means is this. What God made available to you belongs to all of us. The spirit within you, which is what is called Christianity, is also for your brother. The spirit within you, we'll go to the spirit upon a moment. The spirit within you, the Father in you, the Holy Ghost in you, 
is common to all believers. It's from these realities that we provide fellowship, if I'm allowed to use that word. Now, this now goes even to our ministries. Hear this well. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. And verse 4. Paul says, now there are diversities of gifts, which is the word charisma, but the same spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, verse 4. Verse 5 says, now there are diversities of ministries. That's the word administration. It says the same law. Then it says in verse 6, there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God that worketh all in all. Pay attention here now. He now goes further to describe, because the key word there will be verse 5, the ministry of the gifts. The ministry of the gifts. He now describes the ministry of the gifts using a physical body. And that description was so apt because the eye works for the legs. The legs, the feet now, they work for the eyes. Each part works for the other. He uses the physical body there. Now, we've, we've, we've tried to uh, call that the body of Christ. He was actually talking about ministry. So he's saying to us that the eye is common to the feet. The feet is available for the eye. The ears walk with the eyes. The ears walk with the mouth. That is, they are there for one another. Are you following what I'm saying this afternoon? The ministries. They are there for one another. Every part walks for every part. The eye belongs to the eyes. To the ears, pardon me. In chapter 12, again, verse 28, he says, God has set some in the church. In the church. He mentions the apostles, firstly, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After they mention miracles, gifts of healings, helps government, and he mentions diversity of tongues. But watch this. He says to us that these gifts are not for themselves. Because, the, don't forget, we start by seeing all things common. That the Father's supply has become the church's benefit. The Father's supply is what we supply to the church. So, I must never see the Father's supply as a private property. The Father's supply is a public property. The Father's supply is public property. It is fellowship, common. So, I become, as a ministry gift, or a minister of the gift, I am a steward, not an owner. Let me see how you understand what I'm saying here. I'm a steward. That is, you are giving this on behalf of others. Because the supply is common. It belongs to everyone. I need your attention here. And I'm talking to pastors too. Because I want you to understand something very basic. The supply is for the church. The supply is for the church. And so Paul says he gave gifts to men. Ephesians 4.11. He gave some apostles. Some prophets. Some evangelists. Some pastors and teachers. For what? Talk to me for what? For the perfecting of the saints. That means 
It flows to the saints. It's not a title. It's a functional office. It is for the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. He says, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Of the full knowledge of the Son of God. To the perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no longer babes tossed to and fro. I want you to observe something now. Tossed to and fro, Ephesians 4. By every wind of doctrine, he says, Ephesians 4. Every wind of doctrine, then he says, in verse uh, 14. By the slight of men, cunning craftiness whereby the line with the sea. But speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I want us to take verse 16 together. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So no part functions for itself. The ministry gifts is for the church. It's the property of the church. The ministry gift that you are or you have been given by God, it belongs to the church. Who's following what I'm saying here? Come on. It belongs. We must, we must explain it that way. Now, you are the steward of it. But you are a steward of it for the benefit of who? The church. It's not your private property. What you password it? I have passworded the grace of God upon my life. If you want to know the password, hear me out. Sow a seed. There's nothing as ridiculous as that practice. I have run out of words for it. I'm even tired of talking about it. It's a shameful act. For a man to have the guts to tell you to bring money so that he can bless you. I have lost adjectives, nouns, pronouns for such things. It's a shame. But sometimes it's not money some of us demand. We demand attention. We demand other things. So you may not be demanding monetary money, but emotional money. But realize that the gift is for the church. Hallelujah. And so that is why the moment you are giving something on behalf of all of us, see it as a privilege. It's a privilege. The ministry gift is not entertainment. You know, it's not for showing off. It's not for showing off. When we used to go for debates, they used to teach us the intro to the debate to just show off. Just show off. Demo. That's not ministry. What you are doing is not your own. It belongs to everybody. The head of the church and the body of Christ at large. So, the first ingredient of Christian fellowship is to know our commonness. That's the first ingredient. When you know that, you can be proud in the Christian gathering. There will be no basis for it. Those who still relate to believers based on the money in their pockets, they are not carnal. They are hupo carnal. Hupo sakikos. Hyper sakinos. Extra carnal. You don't understand Christianity at all. 
like Paul, like Peter said, you are blind. And you cannot see afar off. You have forgotten. Strong words. So, hear this now. The gifts are for the body. That is why when there was strife in Corinth, because we're going to focus on Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 3, when there was strife in Corinth, Paul said, ah, in verse 21, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. This has been lifted for money. Whether Paul or Apollos, Cephas or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come. Now, when it says death, here, it's referring to the same people. Then it says, things present, things to come, all are yours. Because they are common to you. And you are Christ, and Christ is God. So he said, let a man, chapter 4, verse 1, so account of us. See, 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 now. So, the, so if you see us now, he says, look, stop, stop seeing us as celebrities. If you see us, let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ and stewards. Is that clear now? Yes. Stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man should be found faithful. Say, I'm a steward. Say, I'm a steward. A steward does not write his name on the food he's told to serve. You got a driver to drive a car. Say, go and get the particulars for me. Go and change the license. He puts his name. Say, why do you put your name? I'm, I'm the one driving it now so that it is convenient for me. You put your name on a car that does not belong to you. Say, I'm a steward. Say, I'm a steward. That's why Paul will use the term servant. Dolos. So the ministry gift is public property. The ministry gift is public property. What God gave you is for others. God gave you what belongs to everybody. God gave us, as pastors and ministers and leaders, he gave you what belongs to everybody in this fellowship that we have. And this fellowship that we have, by the work of the Spirit, let me ask you a question. Did you become a minister of the gospel by educational qualification? No. It's not even by prayer. Prayer is because you're a minister. It's a work of the grace of God. Let that be the first thing, just like salvation. Salvation is the work of grace. So because I know that, it means I'm ready to be available for others. Because this faith is a common faith. All right, so... This is how Paul taught giving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 4, he says, look, it, it mentioned the church uh, at uh, uh, Macedonia. He says in verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. That is material things. Pay attention. Chapter 9 verse 13. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them that unto all men. So he calls giving fellowship. That is, the moment there is a need in a, in a brother or in the church, and I have it, by the function of the spirit within me, I make it available. So, because the Father has supplied me the capacity to be selfless, the capacity to love others, He has supplied that for me. The Father did not give me money to give, He gave me the capacity to give what I have. 
So it's not that he gave you money so you give others. No. He gave you the capacity to make things available to others when there's a need. And so the church, which was at Macedonia, even though they had economic crisis, functioned in that capacity. Because the abilities of God has no limits. Recession doesn't stop it. So they made it available because of that fellowship. So the moment we are teaching people to give so that they can have, we defeat the truth in giving. You don't get it. Because even those that didn't have, they gave. Didn't have enough, I mean. So, giving. This is why we also pray. I see the brother's need as my need. So Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit for all saints. Because the saints are in the same body as I am. So in Acts 2, 42, in fellowship, he mentioned breaking of bread, which is physical things, and prayers. So it, 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 it taught, when the doctrine was taught, it had an effect on two things, material things. They broke bread. They shared food. And then prayers, spiritual things, material things, and spiritual things. Why? They were taught that they had things in common. So, our identification in Christ is crucial to Christian fellowship. We must acknowledge the things that are in us in Christ so that we can be effective in Christian fellowship. What we know is not for ourselves. Are you there? Are you still there? So they prayed. That's why in Acts 4, when they threatened two people, Peter and John, the Bible says in verse 23, they went to their own company. The word own company there, the word company there is not original. They went to their own. You know what you say in Nigeria, my personal persons. It's the word ideos. They went to their own ideos, I-D-I-O-S. They went to their own. So because they saw themselves that way, the moment Peter and John, listen carefully, Peter and John, you know, let me tell you what we have done today in some places. Where Peter and John will come, ah, we are threatened though. Eh, you were threatened. How did you speak? How did you preach it? Eh, they threatened you. Well, we pray for you that the Lord will strengthen you. No. The moment they heard that, they now lifted their voice in one accord. So Peter and James, I mean, and John's threats became a common threat. Because there was fellowship in one accord. So, to have a supply of the things that are ours in Christ, in the local church. Some guys hate the term local church. You have just started. In the local church, to have that effective, there must be a strong emphasis on our mutual identification in Christ. The moment we don't see this, it will affect this supply. Such that what I have belongs to you. What God gave me is for you. Watch this now. So, Paul was very strong about this in Corinth. He taught 15 chapters. Hear me well. 15 chapters. 15. Full of addressing dishonor and selfishness. Why? Because, hear this, strife is a seed for dishonor. It's also a seed for unbelief. 
The things God has given to the church, they work effectively by fellowship. When we see the oneness of the church, the things of the spirit work more effectively in unity. And one of the seeds of this unity is dishonor. Or let me put it like this. Dishonor comes from this unity. Look at Mark 6. Where Jesus went to his hometown. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know the Father has given us power. You know that? He has given us his spirit. And so Paul prays that, there's that there should be that supply to all believers. So if we are not seeing that supply, is not from the Father. We have cut the supply to the brethren by things we are doing or things we are not doing. Who's following what I'm saying this afternoon here? Are you following this at all? Please listen. So, in, in Luke 6, sorry, Mark 6, Jesus gets to his hometown. I shared this the other day. He's, he got to his hometown. And the Bible says in verse 5, he could not do any mighty work, save that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. Why? A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, among his own king and his own house. Now, who was Jesus sent to? The same people. Why couldn't he do any mighty work for the same reasons, the same people? So what, is, what belongs to us that is in other believers would not get to us if we treat them differently from who they are to us. I must never be in competition with someone God put in charge of something that belongs to me. It doesn't make sense. Because what he has is not his own. What he has belongs to all of us. I wasn't feel like, ah, is he the only one that can do those things by the Spirit of God? What he's doing belongs to all of us. It's carnality that thinks like that. Who's following what I'm saying this afternoon? Are you getting this at all? So, Paul addressed it. So, Jesus got to a place. Remember, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He has not able to, to heal the sick. The, 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 the Lord anointed him. He's anointed by God, pardon me, to heal the sick. And he gets to the people he sent to, and he couldn't heal the sick. Why? Because they did not accept what he had belonged to them. Eventually, that is what strife means. I don't accept it belongs to me. So, I think... I should compete with it. I should speak less of it because I'm in the flesh. Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. Jesus says this. This is the same story. Then he says in verse 24. I'll start from 23. Okay, 22 actually. <laughs> they said, is this not Joseph's son? That's what they said. 23. You will surely say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whosoever you have heard, done, Capernaum, do also here in thy country. Mocking. Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted his own country. But I tell you, of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. Only the heaven was shut up, when heaven was shut up for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath, a, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. That is, what distinguished them was honor. They welcomed those men. The moment you do not recognize that God's gift in someone else belongs to you, you start to compete. 
you start to hold the thing in disdain. And then the supply is cut off. Say, God's gifts are mine. Say, God's gifts, resident with God's servants, they are for me. Oh, you didn't say that well. Say, God's gifts, resident in God's servants, they are common to us. They are for me. So you rob yourself of what belongs to you. Hallelujah. Strap can be so funny. So funny. And then he says, watch this. And Paul begins to address Corinth from the very first chapter. Watch this. In chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 1, he addresses it. He says in verse 11, For declared unto me by my brethren, which them are in the house of glory, that there are contentions among you, debates. Now I say, some of you say, I hear some of you say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Debates. Debates are unhealthy. That's why I go read the book of Acts. The only chapters you will not find the work of the Spirit and signs and wonders is when they were arguing. Debates. One issue is coming up. We are talking about it. We are talking about it. He said, what's wrong with you guys? He said, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? Are they not God's servants for your sake? It didn't make sense. It didn't make sense. And as often watch this, this went deep into that local church. Very deep. In chapter 2, chapter 3, pardon me, he told them, I can't speak to you as unto spiritual because you walk in strife. So people think strife is healthy. Chapter 3. Strife, verse 3, divisions, envy. He does not mention fornication here or, or not even murder. He says strife. You are reasoning like men that don't have the Holy Ghost. In chapter 4, they are criticizing leadership. It tells them in chapter 4, verse 3, With me it's a small thing that I should be judged of you, of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. I know that myself, yet I am hereby just, not justified, but he that judges me is of the Lord. So he was dealing with all those kind of things. They were just unusual things. Let us learn to avoid distractions in the church. Say, I avoid distractions. In the house of God. Say, I avoid distractions. Sometimes there are so many distractions. So many. And there are people like that. They will just be creating debates. 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 Someone just raised one side and says, I want to ask a question. So what's the question? Why does the pastor take juice after church? What was it for? And they spent, I was told in that meeting, they spent two to three hours. Because people like that, they have a company. They move from juice to pure water to bottled water. And two to three hours where we should have the things of the spirit in demonstration. Prayer made. We should give and meet the needs of others. Teach the word of God. We are asking about juice. Those things are not harmless. They're not harmless. So he says here, he says, to, for me to be judged of you, it's a small matter. Some people will sit down in their homes and be discussing their pastors. You are cutting the supply in the church. That's what you are doing. You are causing the supply. You have to realize that that fellow has what, you be, that what belongs to you and what you need. You have to be wise. In chapter 5, of course there will be disorder. There was a brother who had his father's wife. 
And because things were not in one accord, he was living anyhow in the same place. See the fruits. In chapter 6, after fighting themselves and taking camps, they now went to before unbelievers. Let's leave church. Let's go and settle this with, with allergy. That goes went on and on. Follow me very well. In chapter 8, he addressed the fact that they now are living carelessly. Well, this is what I believe. I don't believe there's something called food to idols. I know the word. So they never cared for those who were just growing. See, the selfishness is growing. Can you see it? Can you see it? And it begins to affect others. He now says, for this for your reason, someone that Christ died will now perish. That is, it now started affecting others. Because sometimes those things will affect those who are by the side. Innocent people. So they perish. They are conscience wounded. In chapter 9, he began to talk about our giving. Chapter 10 again, food over to idols. Chapter 11, he says there are those who have. Because it had gone to everything. It went to the, wait, it went to the way they saw ministers. It went to the way they treated one another, to their behaviors. He said, well, that's his own action. He wants to have his father's wife. Leave him alone. No. Ah, it's okay, that's what he wants. It had cut deep into the church. So in chapter 11, it went into how they were giving. Those who had were showing off to those who didn't have. Can you see it's going to different things? Because something was missing. They were not acknowledging the things that belong to them in Christ. Are you following what I'm saying this afternoon? So when you go to chapter 12, it says now, these are people who he has said in chapter 1, verse 7, they came behind in no gifts. So he wasn't about to give them a new information about the things of the Spirit. He was addressing the things of the Spirit in relation to their conduct. Now, let's, so we have talked about food, we have talked about everything they were arguing over, they were, now, the division affected the things of the Spirit. Now, let us come to things of the Spirit. He now said, wait. They are diverse of the gifts, the same Spirit. Then he says, there are differences of the ministry of these gifts. The same Lord. He says, they are diverse of operation. It's the same God that worketh all in all. But, can you see why I said but? The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man, to profit with all. Why did he say that? Because the things of the Spirit were already being stifled by selfishness. Are you following what I'm saying here? You have to follow the thought pattern from chapter 1. Selfishness had affected the things of the Spirit. They came behind in no gift, but it was not going around. Strife was there. So he mentioned the diversities. All these work at the one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Then he now described the physical body. That the hand cannot see to the eye. I don't need you. People were using the things of the spirit like private property. He said, no. God sent them in the church. Who is following what I'm saying this evening? So strife has a long-term project. Aside from debates, to ministers, to criticizing ministers, he went into how we gave natural things. He didn't know it's coming for the things of the Spirit. So he says, here, then he talk, when he said it, then he said, ah, are all apostles, are all prophets. These gifts are different. Our teachers, do all work miracles. They are different operations. Do all speak with tongues. Do all interpret. Then he says, covet the best gifts. Listen carefully. But I show you, oh, hallelujah, a more excellent way. A way to function in the things of his spirit. Then he taught love. 
So the issue was not they were hearing about the things of this for the first time. He was teaching them how not to stop the flow. He now taught them love. He said, if I speak with tongues of men or angels and have not love, it profits me nothing. If I give my body to be burned, give my food to feed the poor, and have not love, it profits me nothing. There is no profiting when we don't love. Don't forget, he had mentioned in chapter 12 verse 7, it's for common profit. But when there's no love, they cannot be profiting. Who's following what I'm saying this afternoon? So he goes on, say, I show you a more excellent way. A more excellent way. How it is done. So you must desire. Notice the desire he mentions is a desire to edify others. Are you listening here? In chapter 14, verse 1, he now says, follow after love. The word dokio means make a practice of love. How do I make a practice of love? I would desire things of the spirit. I would desire to walk, prophesy. Are you following this one? He that speaks in tongues in the church speaks not unto men but unto God. For no man understands, albeit in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. That means, in the local church, you must not be particular about edifying yourself alone. You know, he's building from somewhere. They were already selfish. So he says, no. You must, by the love of God, make available a supply to the church. Are you there? Because he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it is for the common good. So what was he addressing in chapter 14? Selfishness. Strife. He got so bad, he says, those who don't know, chapter 8, verse 12 and 11, 11 and 12, they are destroyed because of your knowledge. He says, because you have and you are walking in strife, those who don't have, some are sick, some are weak, some even die. Why? His supply is cut off. Are you there? Not knowing that what you are putting your name on belongs to everybody. Belongs to everybody. So two ways. He mentions the love of God. In our practice of the things of the spirit, we are not celebrities. We are not showmen. We are stewards. Say I'm a steward. Follow this now. In chapter 14, in 16, if you bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupies the Lord say, Amen, I give no thanks, seeing that he understands not what you say? You have given thanks well, no doubt, but the other is not what? That means you are not walking in love. Can you imagine that? That means we can cut the supply. He says, if we all come together and we all speak with tongues and there comes in one that is not, that's unlearned or unbelieving, how shall he know what you are saying? It got to the point, there was a lot of disorder in Corinth, every man to himself. He said, no, it is for the common good. So in chapter 14, verse 39, 28, 26, he said, when you come together, everyone has a psalm. You have a tongue. You have a doctrine. You have a revelation. You have an interpretation. Let it be done in love. A key element of believers meeting is love. If we want to consistently see the flow of the Holy Ghost in our churches, we must practice love. We must be ready to meet the needs of others, we must see the things of the Spirit are things given to us for others. Which follow what we're saying here? Are you there? So he says, covet to prophesy. Verse 39. Do not stop tongues, but go further in love and covet to prophesy. Let all things be done decently and in order. The decently and in order there is the love of God. 
tongues plus interpretation, which is prophecy. So a key element of having a flow of the Holy Ghost in meetings is to be selfless. To see yourself as a steward. Therefore, two critical things. And Brother Hagin, you know, taught this a lot. I discovered he, he taught this a lot towards the last 10 years of his life on earth. That when we notice a decline in the things of the Spirit and the power of God in the churches, two things we have to check. Check the love walk. And check the way we honor one another. The love walk. Well, honor is love in action anyway, so they walk together. Honor is love in action. Say it be honor, honor is love in action. So spiritual things work with love. Is that clear? Is that clear? Imagine in Corinth there was a gift of healing and some were sick, some were weak, and some even died. There was enough food for people to go around. Some were sick, some were weak, some died. Why? Because folks did not see themselves as a means for others to receive. See, I'm in fellowship with the brethren. Oh, say like you say, I'm in fellowship with the brethren. I am eager. I'm eager. Wrong sound. I'm eager and desirous. To bless others. See, I'm eager. I'm desirous. I'm passionate about blessing others. My focus in meetings is to be a blessing to others. I'm not selfish. I'm just like my father. He has supplied me his own desires, his own motives, his own passion. I have the same passion. Hallelujah. So the ministry gift is just like that. We must honor one another. Honor those. We see those that God has put over our lives as a gift for our sakes. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 12. Hallelujah. Learning something here? Chapter 5, verse 12. Here's Paul. He says, let's take it together. First, First Thessalonians 5, 12. First Thessalonians 5 and 12. Are you there? Yes, sir. Let's go now. Uh-huh. Hold on before that. Let's read 11 first. 11 first. Let's go. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Hold on now. You know them. They are over you. They admonish you. That's honor. You know them. You recognize them. Look at the next verse. Let's get 13 together. Let's go. And to esteem them very highly. How? In love for their work's sake. Honor without love is hypocrisy. Because if there is no love in honor, then it is not sincere. Love. I'm not selfish about honoring others. He says, watch this, and be peace among you. That means if we honor ourselves and the offices God has chosen, there will be peace amongst us. Where there's honor, there can never be strife. And there will be a free flow of the Spirit. Seest thou a church full of the Spirit? Seest thou a church that is flowing with the Spirit of God? Ceaselessly, you are seeing a church walking in honor and love. You know, Acts 1, everybody was filled with the Spirit. Acts 2, why? They were in one accord. And they respected the twelve. And they were being filled. Let's pay attention here now. Everybody was being filled. Filled. Acts 4. They were all filled. Acts 6. They had to look for those who were filled. Why? There was argument. In Acts 6. 
They were coming about food. So they had to choose Stephen and Philip. Because when those things persist, the things of the Spirit will also wane. Are you following what we're saying here? But where there's love and honor, each man will stand in his office. Each man will do what God has called him to do. And the body of Christ will be blessed for it. We are not in competition. We are not in a race against each other. We are in a love walk. A love walk. A walk of love. Hallelujah. Watch what he says here now. He says, and be at peace among yourself. Now we exalt, exalt your brethren. Warn them that are unruly. There are those who will not want to do this. They warn them. After a church service, you just go out. Someone say, ah, that's for you guys. Oh, me, I'm different too. Say, warn them. That's a selfish brother. Some guys are just selfish. They're just selfish. So, what we thought was ordinary in debates, food, material things, it creeps into the things of the spirit. And we must be cautious. Our motivation for the things of the spirit must be right. We're not in competition in who gives the most accurate word of knowledge. Who heals the sickest sick. No. We just love the church. Say, I love the church. Say, I love the church. It also means I, I, I'm satisfied with the office I am in. The hand doesn't want to be the air. Stay where you are. Where you are, you have enough supply to make enough supply. Hallelujah. So if you are strong about teaching the things of the Spirit, be strong about teaching honor and love. Honor and love. Honor and love. Much love has more fellowship and much demonstration of the Spirit. See how Paul describes Timothy. Are you learning something? Are you learning something here? So don't just teach people charisma, charismata, doma, dosis, diaconia, diaresis, energio, energima. Teach agape. Unfeigned love. Hallelujah. The word honor is the word timeless. To value. We'll see that shortly. Told you open the way now. Philippians 2. Look at how he describes uh, Timothy. Philippians 2. Verse 19. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Can we read verse 21 together? For all seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ. Say, there's no man. Say, this guy, he will naturally care for your state. Naturally. So when you hear about Timothy, he had developed his love walk. Say, I developed my love walk. <laughs> if we want to have the things of the Spirit to walk consistently, we have to develop our love walk. See, and I say this to young ministers, I'm not very old. I'm a very young man, relatively. But I think I've been around a few days. I've seen things come and go. I can tell you that in many instances, they did not have a check on their love work and honor. The moment we don't accept someone in his office and we're competing, we're bidding by to the things of the Spirit. God doesn't consult you to whom he chooses. But you know what? I know what he has is for me. So why am I, what's the dishonor for? What's the strife for? Are, are, are you following what I'm saying here? So watch it. Honor and love. Honor and love. Don't forget, honor is built on love. See how he described Titus to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Are you learning something here? 2 Corinthians 7. And verse 13. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, 
And exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Look at verse 14. For if I have boasted anything of him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we speak all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before of Titus, is found in the truth. Let's take verse 15 together. And his inward affection is more abundant towards you, whilst he remembers the obedience of you all, how that with fear and trembling you received him. Look at two things. The minister loves the church. The church honors him. That's how it works. That's why I said, I'm going to send Titus that he will establish the same grace, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. The same grace in you. See, I walk in love. So, more demonstrations of the Spirit, more love in our midst, more honor. We respect people for what God has placed in them. Hallelujah. We all, we all have the spirit. But we don't all have the same functions. Is that very clear? Say, are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all pastors and teachers? No. But the pastor and teacher is a gift in a man for me. Hallelujah. So because I know it's for me, I honor it. Because whatever premium I placed on it is whatever value I get from it. Hallelujah. I said, Hallelujah. Are you following what I'm saying here? Yes, knowledge frenzy generation hear what I'm saying. Everything is not knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge. I just know. No. There's the grace of God. What God had determined. He has picked men, chosen them. He has put them over you in the Lord. Now, no doubt those men have the duty to be full of the word and to be full of the spirit. To teach the word properly and accurately. We're not trying to excuse that. But I'm just narrowing this discussion down to this. We have honor and love. We have the things of the spirit in demonstration. What does that mean? I'm talking to pastors now. He means that we're going to build churches by the power of the Holy Spirit. That forgive easily. Say we forgive easily. We won't have useless meetings. Hours. Trying to sort settled rifts. Some of us are like that. Your pastor will just be there. Two, three hours. They are saying, Sister John. So, Sister Jane. Well, somebody can be John too. I close here. Sister Jane. I've heard, sir. And she's still frowning. Sister Jane has a supply for us. But we can't get it. As she's frowning. She's angry. She's bitter. We thank God that brother so so and so is ministering to us. But it should have been much more if Sister Jane also participated. Which follow what I'm saying here. So the more of the love of God that we teach and practice, the more of the things of the Spirit. So we forgive easily. So we forgive easily. We also don't consider men after the flesh. Men after the flesh. Because what is mine in you or through you is not after the flesh. Is in Christ. So as I recognize my righteousness in Christ, I also recognize the gift of God for me in Christ. And that in, involves men. Say my pastors, my leaders are God's gifts for me. They belong to me in Christ. I have a precise understanding and recognition of those things that are mine in Christ. So it's not just righteousness that is yours in Christ. The ministry gifts are yours in Christ. Are you listening to what I'm saying here? I'm teaching you Christian fellowship. Hope you are learning something here. I walk in that place and my mind is renewed. I know, oh my God, this is for me. This is for me. It means we look at the treasure, not the earthen vessel. I've told you this. Your pastor says, I'm human, I'm human. That is for him to say. That is not your own confession. Saying your pastor is human is human cuts you off from being blessed. Let him be the one saying it. You say, he's, he's empowered by God for me. He's graced of God for me. It, it's just like 
I, 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 I like to describe. Come, Pastor, let me give you a description. Maybe you're at work, and then your boss, the pastor says he's human. You two, you say, I know my pastor is human. Some of you make that mistake. That shouldn't come from him. Let him be the one saying it. Paul was the one that said, we are men of black passions like you. It was not the church that said it. Your, your, your boss at work does this. He sees you in the morning. He says, ah, how are you? Then he does like this to you. That's in the morning. Then you see him later in the evening. You're MD. You two, you put your hand around him. <laughs> you can't go. <laughs> You're not serious. <laughs> you can go. Thank you. You know, you are not intelligent. He says, I'm human. You say, ah, I know you are human. Your words chart your course in spiritual things. You confess that treasure. What a wonderful teacher my pastor is. When he teaches, I understand it. If he lays hands on me, I come in contact with spiritual realities. He sees things that have a benefit to me. You take your eyes away from the ethan vessel and we look at the treasure in there hallelujah are you following this so we forgive easily we we don't look at things after the flesh we look at the treasure not the vessel not the earthen vessel we receive the grace not the humanity we honor each other we don't despise ourselves no we don't say i don't despise the gift of God around me. So the love of God helps us to yield to the spirit. We walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. We honor what God is doing. We don't speak of it lightly. I've seen people I'm not perfect. I'm growing. But I've seen people make big mistakes. By what they said. I've seen them. There's some. By what they say in their churches. They talk like they're indispensable. More often than not. Their value goes down. That those who talk light. Or spiritual things. They joke. You can't find somebody who jokes about casting out of devils, he will never exercise authority over demons. Watch what you say. When you are angry, don't talk. Deal with the anger before you say something. What you speak against does not work on your behalf. God is not the one working against you. You are the one working against yourself. Learn how to practice Christian fellowship. How to receive and to minister. Make sure you love the church. Don't be about showing off. Be about edifying. Blessing others. And don't be about debates and arguments. Love and honor. Sometimes these people are our cousins. They are our friends. Spouse. Kids. Your child. This is to be your child only when the grace of God is working in him. Your cousin seems to be your cousin only when the grace of God is working in him. Your husband seems to be your husband only when the grace of God works with him. Paul says, I have labored more abundantly than all of them put together. Yet it's not me, but the grace of God that is with me. Grace is also a distinguishing of service in the body of Christ. And the men are special, not because of themselves, but because God put something special in them for you. So I walk in honor. I walk in love. So I walk in love to minister to others. I walk in honor to receive from the ministry of others. I'm not stupid. I'm intelligent in the things of the spirit. Are you blessed this afternoon? Let's just pray in tongues for ourselves. I want us to pray for ourselves. That we walk in the life of honor and love. To enjoy you can hold someone's hand. I want us to pray for ourselves. That there are increase. There's an increase of the things of the spirit in our lives. And the lives of those in the local church. Our churches are full of the spirit. 
who will not be like the church in the book of Acts, who were all full of the Spirit at once. Then later on, decided to look for those who are full of the Spirit. Pray in the Holy Ghost. From henceforth, we watch the things we discuss in private. We watch the jokes that we make. Pray in the Holy Ghost. We honor the laying of hands. We honor the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, the work God gives the faith. We don't mock tongues, the of tongues and prophesy. Prophecy.